Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. Uh, it's an honor today to have Chet Richards here. Uh, I have learned so much from John Boyd and it is so fundamental that even when I've tried to talk to people about it, they get only parts of it. They get at the surface level. And that's not surprising because it is actually a different way of looking at the world and different way of thinking. It's a different metaphysics and a different epistemology. It is very deep. So I'm honored to have Chet here who has been an associate of uh, John Boyd for a long time since 1970s to talk to us about John Boyd, his ideas uh, and the OODA loop and uh, his other ideas, okay? So welcome Chet. Thank you, thank you for having me on. Thanks everybody for coming out on a Saturday afternoon. Wonderful. So Chet, who was John Boyd? Okay, I'm assuming here that most people are familiar with the basics of his life, so I'm not gonna do the uh, chronology uh, per se, um, but it's when you're uh, thinking about John, one of the things to keep in mind is that as, as with all of us, his life went through several, several stages. And the first one we might call very tactical, which was basically, uh, how to win in one-on-one -on -one fighter aviation type combat, which you might think of as gunslinging or um, any other martial art karate, but at 30,000 feet and flying at 650 miles an hour. Um, but it's the same basic principle. And it, it took John a long time to, I think, to realize that, it, that in fact, it was the same, the same principle. And I think part of the reason is if you're talking, say, a martial art, if you're talking um, any of the unarmed martial arts, karate, uh, jiu-jitsu, judo, any of those, um, it's clearly person against person. Um, you have what you have in your body, and that's it. Even if we go to kendo, uh, uh, sword fighting, the swords, they, they can vary, but they're all essentially the same. Now, the, the quality of the swordsmanship, of, of, the, uh, I'm sorry, of the workmanship, of course, varies a number of other things. But um, as, as Musashi, who is one boy's favorite, points out, you don't have to worry about any of that, any of that nonsense. That it's basically whoever gets their point of their sword in the other person first that counts. And uh, so all of the wonderful workmanship that went into the sword kind of comes out in, in the wash. When you're looking at a fighter, though, you're seeing this enormous piece of complicated machinery. And the fighters of the 1950s, 1960s, notoriously unreliable. Uh, particularly by, by modern standards. If you remember back to the movie, The Right Stuff, it starts out with one crash after another, after another. That was, that was, that was the way it was. You go back and, uh, and look it up. You know, our, our leading ace uh, crashed the thing as he was learning how to, uh, how to fly uh, jet fighters. They were terribly unforgiving. The aerodynamics of them wasn't uh, particularly well understood and things happened very, very, very fast. So you spent a lot of time concentrating on the hardware. So that's what John, that's where John started out. When he came back from Korea, he got right in on the last month of the war. Probably the, the greatest regret of his life was that he didn't really get to go and do, you know, the from Tonk High, uh, um, uh, be a fighter pilot kind of thing. Um, there's some question as to whether or not he actually got in on one kill. Some sources credit him with half a kill. Um, uh, Robert Quorum said it's the, the, because it was so late in the war, the documentation isn't totally clear. He never claimed anything on that. Um, he came back from Korea, went to the fighter weapons school, which is graduate school for uh, fighter pilots. He must have impressed somebody to even get into the thing. It's the Air Force version of the Navy's Top Gun, which you may remember from those movies, except that it predates Top Gun by several years. Uh, but it's the same, it's the same concept. It's where the leading pilots of, of each squadron would get sent for an intense, uh, uh, essentially graduate course in fighters. He did very well there, got asked to stay on as an instructor. You may remember that also from Top Gun. And I think did six more years there. He's, he was recognized as one of the top instructors out at the fighter weapons school. And in fact, if you go out to Nellis and make, make an appointment with a, with a public affairs office, you can go visit Boyd Hall, which is still there. Anyway, all of this though was, was basically on how to make this, this, this enormously complex and very temperamental beast behave. And what do you do with it when you, uh, when you do? Now, the fighter pilots of that era, most of those guys had flown in World War II. John was, 
was uh, from the younger group. He was in World War II, very, 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 in fact, he was in the occupation forces in Japan as an enlisted person. All this is in the Quorum's book. Uh, so they're bringing their knowledge on uh, how, how they fought in the Second World War. So we're talking about uh, prop-driven airplanes, piston-driven airplanes. I don't think they were any turbo props at that point. Uh, jet airplanes were just coming out. The Germans had the ME-262 and, a, and a, a couple of others, but not very many of them. Uh, very few pe uh, people with any experience in trying to fly them. So they tended to fly them as if they were the type of uh, uh, a piston engine airplanes that they had back in World War II. So they had every fighter pilot who had survived World War II uh, had his collection of, of little tricks that he did. In other words, if I'm if I'm doing this and I see the other guy do that, then I'm going to do this kind of thing. And they practiced those tricks over and over again. They shared them back and forth among each other. Um, but it was it was essentially a collection of, um, of individual or small unit kind of uh, things that they had learned and tried. And nobody had a really good explanation uh, as to why they worked. Now, I should point out these early fighters. Uh, they could go very fast, particularly their standards in a straight line compared to the piston engine fighters. But once they started to turn, because the engines were, were um, very underpowered compared to what we have today, once they started to turn, they started to lose airspeed. Drag uh, is a function, uh, among other things, your, uh, your turn rate. And once the drag loaded up, the airplane started to slow down. Once the airplane started to slow down, then it would, it would descend. And this is something that had been known to fighter pilots ever since World War I. These little turning battles you think of, um, of the Red Baron versus Snoopy kind of things, they all came down and down and down and down. And the survivor typically brushing the treetops. As the, and, and quite often there wasn't a decisive uh, thing. They got down so low, they just sort of agreed to break the fight off by mutual, mutual consent. The same problem happened with fighter airplanes. So they had to have stuff that they could do very, very quickly. And that's where Boyd with his his years of experience, both in um, in the school itself and then as being an instructor in the school, where he could go out and practice this stuff virtually every day. And I say one, a little bit of an aside here, the, the difference between uh, Nellis and, and Edwards Air Force Base, if you remember the right stuff again, all that happened down at, at, out at Edwards, those are test ponds. They're a completely different breed apart. They, uh, they take the airplane out to uh, and fly points that the engineers said that we want to see what happens if you do this and this and this. So they go out and they fly that point. Sometimes what happened is not what the engineer predicted. And that's why you saw all those crashes back at the early. So it, it takes a, a tremendous amount of courage, a lot of understanding of the airplane itself, tremendous knowledge of aerodynamics and all that stuff to be a test pilot. To be a Nellis type fighter pilot takes a fair amount of that, but we're going to bring a second person into the uh, equation now who, while all this is going on, is trying to kill you. So essentially what the Nellis uh, folks did was they took what had been discovered out at Edwards, plus they knew what they did on their own, and they tried to, to apply it against each other. So that's sort of the difference between a fighter pilot and a test pilot. So what a fighter pilot is doing is he's going out every day, and it was all he then, by the way, certainly not that case today. Um, but it was, it was all he back then. And they would go out and they would try things against each other. Then they'd come back to the bar that night, the famous O Club, and they'd stand around and they'd drink and they'd do this and they would trash talk each other. And the next day they would go out and do it again. And so that's kind of how over and over six years of this, they built up this, this skill set. Now what Boyd stumbled onto was a way to win virtually every time in a very short period of time if, the, if certain initial conditions were correct. The first initial condition was that the person you were fighting had to have never seen this happen before because if they knew what was gonna happen, there were, there were fairly easy ways to defeat it. So what he would tell his, his folks, they would come into the base, he would meet them right at first, take them aside, make this little bet with them, they'd go up and fly, before they had, and, and, and the other instructors were sworn to secrecy, not to say a word about what happened. So Boyd would have his airplane in front and the student would be in back and when they uh, started the engagement, Boyd had 40 seconds to get his airplane around and into a firing position on the opponent. Now, all they had at that time were guns that fired forward. It was the only armament. These are, so you had to get in a position where, where you could shoot. You can shoot from straight, but things are happening so fast and bounding around the sky, your odds of hitting anybody are very small. The only way you really got uh, a chance to destroy anybody was either ambush them, come up on the top, 
the bottom, or get on their tail, get in close, and yell, gun, gu guns, guns, guns. They, uh, they also had uh, um, a gun camera so they could so they could say who was doing what. Well, these guys figured, okay, it's going to take Boyd longer than 40 seconds to get back. Okay, how good he is. There's an aerodynamic limit to how fast you can turn the airplane. So all I got to do is just kind of stay with him. And 40 seconds later, I'll have won. So they started the engagement out. The turn started. All of a sudden, Boyd would pull the airplane up into a deep stall way out of the envelope. You're not even supposed to, to do this with an airplane. And the airplane would fall back down. Meantime, this guy's continuing on. Boyd comes in right behind him, rolls out, yells, gun, gun, guns, and that's it. This maneuver is extremely, extremely dangerous because it's very easy to lose control of the airplane, have it turn over, go into what's called a flat spin, which basically means the thing becomes a rock. There's no, no aerodynamic forces acting on the wing that you can control and impacts the ground shortly thereafter. And again, that's what you saw in the first part of the movie, the right, the right stuff. Even today, a flat spin is, uh, for the most part, unrecoverable. But then uh, modern airplanes today have got all kinds of stuff to ensure that they don't get into that condition. But if you're, if you're rocking this beast up and it's pretty unstable to begin with, and it does, uh, it's liable to do most anything when it gets gets way up like, you know, in this thing, Boyd figured out a way to control it and actually bring it back down. And win. so it was this highly unexpected maneuver that you were never supposed to do. You'd get court martialed if you tried, but he figured out how to do it. And that was the trick to 40 second boy. All right, that's really good. 1962, he goes off to Georgia Tech to get a second bachelor's degree. And the reason he chose Georgia Tech is his son had polio and they wanted to go to the Warm Springs, which is which is south of Atlanta, about an hour, hour and a half. Uh, it's still there, by the way. It's where uh, Franklin Roosevelt, a little White House was. And there's a wonderful resort there if you play golf, Callaway Gardens. Beautiful gardens too. If you're in the butterflies, it's uh, fantastic. They have a Cecil Day Butterfly Museum. Anyway, that's about an hour and a half south of Atlanta. And he would take his son down there for, um, for treatment. Meantime, he's at Georgia Tech, which is right in downtown Atlanta. And his, his original bachelor degree was in economics in the University of Iowa. Uh, he wasn't particularly impressed with Iowa. From everything I've been able to find out, talking with Iowa alums, the feeling was mutual. So um, other, than, <laughs> other than admitting under duress that he had a degree from there, he didn't figure he really learned very much from Iowa. It turns out he actually learned quite a bit because economics basically forms, in, in a sense, the heart of everything that he's doing, as we'll get back to shortly here. Anyway, he's at Georgia Tech, and now he's running across um, some really it, what to him were advanced ideas because he didn't have physics for an economics degree. So he's taking physics and in physics, he runs across the second law of thermodynamics. He runs across the entropy principle. And he's had enough math by then to, to understand it mathematically, but he also says, you know, there's gotta be more going on than all this weird equations and, 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 and align integrals, you know, and all this kind of nonsense. And, he's, and he was talking with, and he, Quorum described this thing, talking with one of the students that he studied with, probably half his age or less. And the guy said something like, well, what it really means is that the energy is there, but you can't use it. And John said, it was like a light came on above his head because that's what happened in a fighter if you got too slow. The energy was there. The engine was just pumping out energy like mad. But because of the, of the environment you were in, you couldn't use it until you built up enough speed, got enough airflow going over the control services to where you could start to use it again. And he said, it's not just when you're in a stall, but in any position in an airplane, there's a certain amount of energy that's being, that the, that, that's being done that you can't use. It, that for whatever reason, the airplane just won't, won't take it at that point in time. Uh, in a car, it'd be like you press down on the throttle, but for whatever reason, there's a lag before you actually start getting some acceleration. Only that applies to gasoline-powered cars. Uh, and John said, it's that, it's that same idea. There's energy there but I can't use it. So under what conditions in an airplane do I have this? And that's where he came up with his first formula uh, for specific excess power. And he said, well, this is, this is really interesting. It doesn't tell me anything I already knew. And then another light came across his head. You know, idiot, there's two people in this, not just me. What's important is not what my airplane can do. It's what my airplane can, can do relative to the other airplane. So I can be bad, but if the other airplane is worse, I've got an advantage. I can use some of that excess energy now to accelerate, to climb, or to, uh, or to turn tighter than he can. And that gives me options in this thing. Because if he's, if he's burning off energy and slowing down, and I'm not, if I still have more energy left, I can continue to close on him. I can follow him down. I can follow him up. 
all kinds of stuff I can do. So that led to the energy maneuverability. So he would plot this, this specific excess power, which is thrust minus drag divided by weight, as I, as I recall, very, very simple formula. Uh, he would plot curves that, he, uh, that for all kinds of combinations, airspeed and altitude and turn rate combinations. Then he would plot those for the other side. Being Air Force active duty Air Force officer, he could get he could get uh, information on, for example, what the MiG-17 and the brand new MiG-21 that it had just out, what they could do, what the F-4 could do, which was coming out as our brand new fighter for both the Navy and the Air Force. The F-105, F uh, F-104, F all those kind of F-106, the interceptor, all those kind of stuff. He could get the data for it. Now he's graduated from Georgia Tech and he's down at Eglin Air Force Base. And I don't remember what he was supposed to be doing down there. What he was really doing is energy maneuverability. So he hooks up with, uh, um, with, with a guy named Tom Christie, who is a senior civil servant down there, uh, background in statistics, as I recall. And Tom has access to the computer. <laughs> ah, now the computer back there had much, much, much less performance than your iPhone. I mean, your iPhone probably has more performance than every computer the Air Force had put together. Maybe about what you have in your watch nowadays, if that much. So it took it forever going through cranking these points out. Um, and then John would take the, uh, you know, take the readouts out and by hand plot the curves for specific excess power. And then he'd do the same for the other side. And then when he talked to overlay them, he literally laid them on top of each other. And then you could see the areas where where one airplane had an advantage in the air, areas where the other airplane had an advantage. So what this told John is, you can teach pilots to do this. If you find yourself in this kind of a situation, you're bleeding off energy, you need to move out of that environment. And it told them where to move it into, lower the nose, increase the throttle, uh, to decrease your turn rate, or, or you've got enough energy now that you can increase your turn rate, and that, all that kind of good stuff. So you want to put yourself into a position where you have an, in, this energy advantage over your, um, over your opponent, where you have options that, that they don't. Uh, if you want to see what some of the curves look like, if you go to, um, and if we have enough time later on, I, I can pop one up for you, but, but if you go to my website, slightly east of you, and um, you can give them that, that link later if they don't already have it, Shikant. Mm -hmm. But and you click on articles and you scroll down, you'll see new conception for air-to-air -air combat, if you, which is, uh, uh, declassified, no, that's, that's the NASA version of some declassified charts, but it's got energy maneuverability charts in there. You can see what they look like. All right, so this is really cool. The Air Force likes it, and, um, and John becomes a big hero. Uh, he gets called up to the Pentagon to look at the, uh, the new fighter that the Air Force is, is coming out with to critique it in light of his energy maneuverability uh, concept. At that time, uh, again, going back to World War II and to extent, uh, some extent, even World War I con uh, combat, the emphasis was on uh, higher and faster. So what happened was airplanes were getting bigger and bigger engines, smaller and smaller wings, because the smaller wing is less drag, with a very few exceptions like the Delta Wing um, F-106 uh, F uh, still you know, had good performance. But the idea was to make them go faster and faster and faster and go higher so that you could you could ambush them, you could see them up here, you could dive down, you could engage them, and you could be gone before they could do anything about it. That was how they, uh, how Bob Richthofen became an ace in World War I, how Eric Hartman became an ace in World War II. And it was essentially um, a pick off, pick off people that didn't, that looked like they didn't know what they were doing and then get out. Um, Incidentally, statistically, it's, uh, it's, it's been shown, and I think you can even find this, this data unclassified. Now, if you survived your first, I think it was two decisive engagements, that is where one side or the other got shot down, your odds of becoming an ace were virtually 90%, because most people didn't survive their first engagement. Most people got shot down in their first engagement where, where one side or the other got shot down. Most engagements ended in a um, maybe some damage to both sides, but but without you know each side being shot down. That's what happens with guns? That's why you wanted to get in really really close. That's why the really good aces had tremendous eyesight, but they also would come right in until the, the the exhaust of the person they were after was singeing their cockpit. Then they would shoot because you're bouncing around the sky. These bullets are just going all over the place. Most and you're going fast. And you only have a, a very fraction of a second. Uh, so the really, really good guys had these tremendous reflexes, can get in very, very close, shoot, and be gone. All right. Uh, 
So what Borg was thinking was, well, this is really interesting. And but that's not what the new F-15, FX, as they called it, design looked like. The FX looks like son of SR-71. It's this long thing, or maybe son of Concorde, something like that. It's this long, thin thing, big engines, fairly small wing, designed to, to go Mach 2.5, Mach 3, something like that. And it, had, and it was going to deploy wonder weapons, uh, the air-to-air -air missiles that were just coming out at the time, two varieties. Uh, one guided by radar in the front of the airplane and one called the heat seeker would actually would um, was an infrared missile it would see the exhaust of the other airplane and and home in on it the first was a sparrow second was sidewinder uh, the navy had those plus they had one called phoenix that was on the f-14 it's also a radar guided missile um, and they also had missiles that were radar guided in some part of the envelope and um, IR guided when it got in close anyway missiles had two things in common. They were very expensive, which meant that they were very rare and they didn't work very well. Um, the third thing in common was because they were very expensive, they, you never had a chance to train on them because you couldn't afford. So they trained on simulators or they trained on a, a device that just had the sensors hooked up. You got in where you heard beep, 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 and you press the trigger and, that, and, it, and it registered a kill for you. But basically we, went, uh, we were going into Vietnam at that, at that time and we were, and we were doing our, um, our, our preparations against the Soviet Union. With this this idea that was left over from essentially World War One, modified World War Two, but with wonder weapons. And the airplane was going to be very expensive because to go Mach 2.5 or higher required not only uh, big booming engines, but required all kind of exotic materials, lightweight materials that could withstand the G forces involved, and also could take the heat from the air air flowing over it. The thing had, by John Boyd's uh, uh, energy maneuverability, had virtually zero chance of ever portray, put, uh, prevailing in air-to-air -air combat. And everybody was wondering, well, how come the Soviet Union's making these small, stubby little airplanes that, that you know, fly in tight little circles and things like that? We all said, well, it's because they don't know what they're doing. You know, uh, you know we've got this down pat. But the Air Force, the, uh, the Air Force generals who controlled what the new airplane was going to look like immediately saw that Boyd was right. That the that uh, via energy maneuverability we needed airplanes that could that could get in could engage could turn and one reason for that was we, the Soviet Union had so many more airplanes that we had these slashing attacks where you come down pick off one straggler at the end and go back to the top may make you an ace but they weren't going to do anything for the outcome of the war you need to be able to get in engage turn and and stay engaged until you until you did damage to the attacking forces. So what happened was the airplane shrunk back down, the wing grew, uh, the type of engines they put on it changed radically. It went from turbo jets, which, had, which was essentially a long tube that you shove fuel into and it had compressors and things and it fired it out the back to a turbo fan, which had this big fan in front of the thing, which also gave you a fair amount of thrust, thrust in addition to the jet that was on the top. And that's why when you, you look at the engines of airliners from the 50s, they look like this, and engines of the airliners today, the end look like that. Big fan on the front. The turbofan had uh, a tremendous increase in, in range. It used a lot less fuel, um, yet it could still propel the airplane up to, uh, to supersonic or near supersonic speeds. To get it to go to Mach 2.5, however, that's two and a half times the speed of sound, you had to put a second engine on the back that was basically a rocket and uh, it's called an afterburner. And so what you did there, when you wanted to go fast, you, flip, you, you cut this uh, afterburner on, it sucked fuel out of your fuel tanks and being essentially a, a, a turbojet, almost a rocket, shoved it out the back really fast and your airplane went really fast for a fairly short period of time because it would tend to run out of fuel. But the F-15 had been designed so that it was, um, that it could, they could do this, exotic materials, big engines and all of that. Um, but in actual fact, it really wasn't very useful. And John got to thinking about that too. And about this time, it dawned on him that what he had really done while he became 42nd boy didn't have a lot to do with energy maneuverability because energy maneuverability would get you in the fight, but it didn't really tell you what to do from there. Remember, he had this weird, strange maneuver that he did. And he said, you know, what really, really happened was I was able to do something and exploit it before the other side could figure it out. Because if they knew what I was going to do, they could just break off. And I'd be up here, you know, hanging, hanging out like this. They could make a tight turn or go up and down and then come right down on my tail. 
So it's very important that I could that I could do this before the other side figured out what was going on. And that influenced the design of the um, of the YF-60 and to some extent the 17, the lightweight fighters that, that came beyond the, uh, uh, right after the F-15. So we're talking late 60s now when all this is happening, um, going into production. And if you look at an F-16, it's got a single engine. It's a much smaller airplane than an F-15. It may not be entirely obvious, uh, but it's got a completely different kind of wing that the, than the F-15 has. The early F-16s were very unstable, very much like the airplanes he had flown out at Nellis. And what we mean by that was in a stable airplane, if you take your hand off the stick, for example, if you raise your nose up, take your hand off the stick, the, the airplane, the, the nose will tend to come back down. Um, if you go out and fly little single engine prop airplanes like I used to fly, no, they demonstrate all that. Pull it back, take your hand off the stick, and it goes shroom, right back to where it's supposed to go. In an unstable airplane, if you start the nose up and take your hand off the stick, it continues going up. And see, this is real good for being able to make very tight turns because you, you just start the turn and then the airplane kind of takes over from there and makes it tighter and tighter and tighter until you black out. Um, so what you had to do in that case in order to control the airplane was you needed a, a, essentially a computer. And so in the F-16, the pilot doesn't fly the airplane. The pilot tells the uh, computer what he wants the airplane to do and the computer flies it. As the F-15 pilots used to say, the pilot gets a vote. But what this allowed was the F-16 to, to be very easy to flit around the sky. Very, very difficult for an F-15, for example, to, to convert on an F-16 if they're in air-to-air -air combat. Now, as they made the airplane heavier and heavier, as the Air Force got their hands on, added more and more stuff to it, it, became, it, it got down more and more towards stable, where now they say it's about neutrally stable. But it's still flown by the computer, as are essentially the latest versions of, of, of F-15s and virtually every Airbus after the original A300 all flown by wire. Like I think the now the uh, uh, even the original A300s will fly by wire. I know the A320 was fly by wire in the later versions of the A330. The Dreamliner, the 777, these are all fly by wire type airplanes. Because the computer can just, it's just so much faster. It can see a lot more than, than you can. And assuming that the people programming it knew what they were doing, as the 737 MAX people can, can tell you, um, it all works out a lot better. So with all that in mind, Boyd got, got, to, got to thinking, you know, this energy maneuverability is all that is fine, but you know, that's really not what allows you to triumph in air-to-air -air combat. And then he retired from the Air Force. He was passed over as a general. So he got out in 1975 and got a little contract from NASA. And NASA said, hey, why don't you take a look at all these models that we have and look at your experience and tell us why sometimes the air-to-air -air models we have work and sometimes why they don't. And that's new conception for air-to-air -air combat. And right at the end of it, he said, well, the reason is the fundamental principle is he who can handle the fastest rate of change wins. And that was it. Mm -hmm. So he had all these diagrams in there, but what it really said was he who can handle the fastest rate of change wins, because that's what was happening. He was, he was changing the situation so fast that this pop-up maneuver, he could exploit it for the other guy. His confusion began to set, you know, because you were never supposed to do this. Squadron pilot would never be court martialed if, if he did that. Uh, way out of the envelope, very unsafe, unsafe maneuvers. Stand of our people would crucify him. So they, uh, but he said, that's really the way to win. He said, and, and then he started, uh, if, it, if you look at that presentation, he's got two other examples, and two of them are from land warfare. Fair. One of them is the Blitzkrieg versus the, the uh, marginal line mentality. Not Blitzkrieg versus the marginal line, but against the marginal line mentality. And the other one was the Entebbe raid, uh, where Israel went into uh, uh, to Entebbe, the airport near the capital of Uganda, and rescued a bunch of hostages and only lost one, one person in doing it. And again, they got in, created confusion, explored it before the other side could figure out and got out. And the Ugandans were, were pretty good, actually, tactically. They'd been trained by the Brits for years and years. And even Idi Amin was a former NCO, senior NCO in the British, uh, British forces there. These guys were, were, were not bad. So the, the trick was don't present a target to them in the first place. Uh, they know how to operate weapons. They know small unit tactics. The trick was create confusion, get in, do, your, uh, do what you got to do, and get out before the other side figures out what's going on. In other words, don't get better in engaging them in, 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 in straight up combat. But do what you got to do and get out without engaging in combat. And that also struck somebody, I, I think, actually pointed out to John that that's almost word for word out of Sun Tzu. 
whom John had probably never heard of at that time, or if he had, hadn't paid much attention to it, because uh, it was all about land warfare in China in 400 BC. And John was about, you know, this kind of stuff. But he got to thinking, yeah, yeah, that's basically what it That allowed me to win without without fighting. It's just what they allowed the Agandans to do was win without fighting. And even in this kind of thing, I won before I actually said, you know, pulled the trigger and said gun goes gun. I had won a long time before that. I won as soon as that airplane came came down behind me that that fight was over. So uh, that led him on this long excursion then uh, where this is 1976. Now he'd, he'd been retired for about a year. Tom Christie had given him a an office in the Pentagon and a one day a week contract to preserve a security clearance. And he got egged on by uh, some of his friends, Pierre Spray in particular, to say, look, you, you mentioned Blitzkrieg against the, uh, the uh, marginal line mentality, but it's also clear you don't know screw all about the Blitzkrieg. So why don't we, why don't you spend some time and start working on that? Well, with John, there's only, there, there were only two settings, you know, full on and full off, and full off didn't work. So he was full on 24 seven. He was, he was working on this problem and he took it through various iterations that he called warps based on the Star Trek, warp one, warp two, that kind of stuff. And he was adding to it. Each warp was a little bit thicker, had a little bit more stuff in it because he had learned a little bit more about land warfare. And they said, well, you really need to go back into history and bring it, you can't start with the Blitzkrieg. You got to understand where it came from. So he went back and he started with Battle of Marathon he started with Sun Tzu technically, but he didn't analyze any battles that Sun Tzu was ever in because for two reasons. First, we don't have any, any uh, good information in any of those. And second, it's not clear that the, the, of a person named Sun Tzu ever actually existed or if he did, how much he had to do with what we call the Sun Tzu text now. The reason I say that is people have, have pointed out that there are contradictions within it and, uh, um, and some other things. It was clearly though, there's a core around uh, uh, the Sun Tzu book, which we call classical Taoism. And everything kind of revolves around that core, but like so many things, it was probably added on to by other people um, later on. And then of course, commentators started uh, adding stuff on and actually signing their, their commentaries. But anyway, the idea of winning without fighting is best uh, kind of struck John. And because the corollary is that then if you do have, have to fight since you've already won, it should be pretty easy. And so that's kind of, he looked at the Battle of Marathon, that's what he saw. He looked at uh, uh, next to a uh, Kanai, um, the Roman loss to, uh, uh, to Hannibal over in the eastern shore of, what, of the Italian peninsula near what's now Brindisi. And incidentally, by the way, if the, 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 the notion there was that, at, that after some preparatory work, Hannibal completely surrounded the Roman army, jammed them in elbow to elbow, and then started pelting them with uh, uh, arrows and rocks and, and, and things like, and they couldn't move. And only the people around the outside could even begin to use their weapons. But there were, there were plenty of, uh, of Carthaginians to, uh, to fight them. If you saw Game of Thrones, the Battle of the Bastards was explicitly based on uh, the Battle of Cannae. So if you're a Game of Thrones fan and still have your HBO uh, membership or you download the, the DVDs, Go back and look at the Battle of the Bastards and you'll see exactly what, that, uh, that kind of thing. And the reason was, um, it turned out that unlike the, uh, the Romans, uh, Jon Snow uh, and, and, and his guys actually won the Battle of the Bastards, but it was for a different reason. Anyway, so he's working up through history and everywhere he goes in history, particularly where he saw a smaller force defeat a larger one, he saw the same pattern going. One side was able to confuse, discombobulate, deceive, change the other side, spring surprise on them. But more important than that, they were able then to exploit it, not just before the other guys could exploit it, but before mentally they could figure out what was going on. Very, very interesting. That's patterns of conflict in a nutshell. I saved you 185 pages of reading there. You'll, you'll thank me later, particularly if you've seen what some of those charts look like. John goes on, by the way, to do a lot of generalization. It's fascinating. Uh, he talks about various categories of conflict. I think it's one of his, his his biggest contributions, because it applies to all forms of conflict, not just war, including business. But, uh, but, it, but essentially, that's, that's it. If you're dealing with an opponent in a zero-one type situation, that is where one side where one side wins, they take it away from the other side. One side can only win if the other side wins. Then this ability to be able to change the situation and explore it more rapidly than the other side, which later became known as operating side the Oodaloo, is a, is a fundamental key. And in fact, in every place where he saw the 
the uh, smaller or less technologically advanced side defeat the larger or more technologically advanced side, that process was operating. So that's basically Boyd in a nutshell. That was wrapped up in 86, sort of, but he continued making changes to it. And some of my notes I have as late as 1991. Incidentally, the version that's on slightly east of you is one that Chuck uh, Spinney, who was probably his closest associate while all this was going on, Chuck and I got together and we took all the little notes where John had called us up and said, hey, go look at chart 123. Now cross this out and write that in. What do you think about that? Well, I think it's great, John, thank you. And, uh, and we, have, we each had one version where we had, where we had made all these changes. Plus I had the presence of mind to actually take a few notes uh, uh, on my telephone calls to them and actually save them where I could find them here and was able to, to dig several of them up. And so what you have on the version of patterns of conflict that's on slightly east of you is the version with all of the changes that John made that we that we know about up until about 1992 or so when he, when he quit changing it completely um, um, have been incorporated. Now, the reason for that he didn't bring out any new versions past 1980. 86 for patterns, 87 for strategic game, or is he lost his type? His daughter, Mary, Ann, uh, Mary Ellen Boyd, was doing his type. Well, as happens, she graduated and left. So, uh, so at that point, then uh, he had a real hard time getting new presentations made and old ones corrected. Uh, I helped him a lot with the conceptual spiral, but I didn't do the initial version of that. I don't know who he got to do the initial version of that one. Um, but I did the, um, the, um, the version of uh, the essence of winning and losing. So um, I, I put that into several different versions and finally into um, um, Apple um, Keynote. So uh, that's the story about that stuff that's out there. And each time he got to thinking about what did he do? Why did it have the effect on the other side? And more important, how was he able to, how was the side that won able to enforce it? Well, if you're going to change the situation before the other side can figure it out, you go back to Sun Tzu, Musashi, all of these guys, they thought about the same problem. And they came up with the same answer. And the answer they came up with has several parts, but there's two, well, there's four biggies, but uh, the, there are two we're going to talk about. The four, you have a variety of things you can choose from so you don't become predictable. And that you can choose from intuitively. In other words, you can rapidly select between them. And to do this, you have to harmonize the efforts among the people on, in your organization. And finally, to make it work, you have to take the initiative. Now, going back to the fighter days, they're like this, Boyd takes the initiative, he pops up. Um, and all these land battles, at some point, in order to lull the other side into a trap or to confuse them and exploit it, the side that won sees the initiative and took it uh, and kept it very early on. It didn't make any difference if they were on defense or offense. Uh, you think it would be easier if you're on offense, and if there, if there weren't deception in the world, that might be true. A lot of times, what you see as offense, the other side may see as, ha, they're falling into my trap. So you have to, you have to consider, in Battle of Marathon, ideal, ideal case of that, the, uh, the person fell right into the Greek trap and, um, and, and got themselves obliterated by the flanking attack that came uh, predictably afterwards. Um, and all the blitzkrieg is the same thing. It was set up things and explode. Take seize the initiative to set something up, lure the others has and explore. And by the way, in the initiative in the blitzkrieg, you think about this being you know this this monster column of tanks roaring right at you. That wasn't the way it, way it way it was at all. Most blitzkrieg actual battles, they, they were trying to lure the other side into a trap. And then once that trap was over, then the tanks would work forward to do the exploit uh, the exploitation. It was just too dangerous. To, to get tanks out by themselves in front of things, they're just too easy to destroy. They have a lot of armor, but but only in certain areas, and the backs were typically hardly protected at all. And the reason is, if you tried to armor them up so they were completely invulnerable, they wouldn't move. They would bog down. And the first time that they came to, uh, you know, came them up, which is what happened to the Tiger, um, which was the sort of going to be the German super super tank and heavily armored, and it was. I mean, there was no way a Sherman tank was going to take out a Tiger from the front. But you could lure the tigers into attacking. They were very easy to destroy from the side. Uh, in fact, a, a, a person with a bazooka from the back could, could do a lot of damage to a tiger to take out its treads. And if it hit it just right, it could, it could take out the engine. So, you know, they had to, 
there's a lot of finesse that goes. Even if you have tanks, it's still the same mental process, the same way of thinking, the same mindset over and over and over again, just applied in different ways. And that's what he finally came to in um, uh, conceptual spiral, which is incidentally, Shrikant, and you probably notice this, is simply a restating of destruction and creation. Yes, uh, yes. That, 20, that's... Years, 20 years difference in between them. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I, I, I love those two very much, you know, destruction and creation and conceptual spiral, because yeah. they state his kind of metaphysics worldview and epistemology in the clearest way. Yes. Which is much, which is completely universal. So both, both destruction and creation. So, um, so firstly, Chet, this is amazing, amazing start of, you know, put, putting on the table what uh, John Boyd did and how he did it. But uh, what I was thinking of doing is to look, look at destruction and creation and then the conceptual spiral, because that, that will provide many, many different data points for the audience to understand what this way of thinking is. So uh, in destruction and creation, you know, I, was, I went through it again yesterday. Mm. Uh, it is, I mean, the, the fascinating thing is that he kind of puts his finger on the heart of it. You know, what you're trying to do is you're trying to improve your capacity of independent action. So this, the principle that you talk about initiative, that's, mm -hmm. that's what you're trying to maintain at all times. And then he talks yeah, about uh, you know, looking at, you know, given that, then you can cooperate with people or compete with people as to whether they are supporting your independent capacity of independent action or are trying to impede that. Um, exactly right. He talks about it at a conceptual level that in order to make sense of the world and to be able to act, you need to have a worldview. You need to have concepts. You need to have a conceptual idea of what is going on. Mental model, as we say. Yes, um, or models. And then whatever you do, however well you succeed in having a model at a given time, the world keeps changing. If you keep focused on the model that you have inside your head, then with time, it is degrading all the time. And right. it is be, being kind of off uh, because of various factors, because of Godel's incomplete theorem, because of entropy, because of Heisenberg's, you know, our ability to measure things. It, you know, if, no matter how well you do, that has very limited shelf life. So you have to continuously keep going back and forth in the open system between your conceptions and the world to keep updating them, keep updating them all the time. And that's what, you know, that's what the destruction uh, and creation uh, and it basically, it, he talks about these two processes, which is just beautiful of saying that you have to use this destructive deduction of kind of taking apart the previous connection that you did into this giant things. And then at the same time, as you're doing that, you have to do, you know, creative or constructive induction, put together things in a way that brings everything together better. And you keep doing that, keep doing that. And that's what thinking is all about. Mm -hmm. That's Just, a very good, very good summary of it. Uh, one thing destruction and creation doesn't have, which got added later, is the uh, um, the idea of the opponent or the competitor. Uh, but it's the same thing, exactly. The only difference there is that your competitor may be actively doing things, both to try to lock your current orientation, uh, lock it up so that it, so that it doesn't change, make sure you don't see uh, you don't see mismatches, and then if he's really doing it right and very lucky, when uh, when he gets ready, all, your, your orientation will become clear. You'll have what uh, causes it's called this coup d'oeil. You'll see exactly what's going on. You'll rush in to exploit it and you'll get killed because it was a trap. It was, remember, we said most of the Blitzkrieg is based on traps. Sun Tzu said all warfare is based upon deception. Mm -hmm. Corollary to that is if it ain't based on deception, it ain't war. But what it is, it's some kind of you know, thing that goes out and kills people and doesn't accomplish very much, but it's not war. War, all war is based upon deception. I think that's, that is absolutely exactly right. And all that, is, uh, all that comes in between destruction and creation, which you, which you did a, a, a very good job of, of uh, decoding for us there. Those of you that haven't tried to read it, give it a shot. And 
Conceptual Spiral, which came out uh, what, 26 years later. Um, and uh, 16 years later, I'm sorry, get my, get my addition right, 76 to 92. Um, and what he did in Conceptual Spiral is he went back to that and he said, look, okay, we all say you need these, you need actions that you can, you can initiate intuitively and you can communicate implicitly. In other words, when, when time, when the crunch is on and you're actually in, in a, in a fight, in business, when you're in a business competition, although the time scales in business are different, the, the process is still the same, um, you pretty much got to use what you already have. Um, you can imagine yourself in a sword fight, for example, and you say, gee, I wonder what would happen if I tried this. Well, odds are it's not going to work because nothing ever works the first time. You're not, you're not used to holding it, the sword slip out of your hand and it won't, it won't go quite where you want it, that kind of thing. And more important than that, now you're vulnerable to the other guy coming in. So the stuff that you use, has got to be stuff that you can use intuitively. The guy comes in, he tries this. You don't sit down and say, all right, well, it looks like he's got this sword up here and that sword down here and they're moving in this direction. I can do this, I can do that. You know, by that time, your head's rolling on the ground. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you just, it's, it's back and forth, intuitive uh, measure, countermeasure. Like, like Boyd said, more like basketball and soccer than American football. Stuff's going on all of the time, and you're and you're you're trying to lure the other person out of position. You're trying to fake them out. You're trying to understand that whether it succeeded or not. You're trying to see if he's getting confused. Ambiguity is different than deception. Of course, in ambiguity, you're confused. In deception, you're you're certain. There's no confusion. It's just wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and the two play together extremely well. But all this is going on at the same time. Mm -hmm. So the trick is having these intuitive action that you can use to influence the outcome uh, in your favor. Okay, where are these intuitive actions? And by the way, the intuitive is not only in the action itself, it's in the brain, because the brain's got to trigger it. In other words, you may physically have the action, but until your brain is wired up to know when to use the action, how to use it, and to decide if it's working or not, um, you, really, you, still, you, know, you still don't have anything. You're basically still doing gymnastics rather than, than competition. So all this is going on. How do we make it happen? And that's what, that's what a conceptual spiral is all about. And that's where he got the, that's where the, the OODA loop itself, the real loop, loop, OODA loop, observe, orient, decide, act in that order comes in. Uh, because you stop and think real quick, once you're in this kind of thing, you don't have time to go through this nonsense. You stop and try to make a decision, you're dead. You, all that decision making should have been, you know, should have been done years ago. The explicit decision making and the implicit decision making of what's what what maneuver to use next is going on inside your head and very very quickly. You may not even be aware of it because it's it's it, it's happening so quickly. And so, how do you make all that happen? And what you do is you try it out and learn from the results. That's why you find virtually all training. Particularly all all good good military training is they start off with the fundamentals, but they very quickly start putting it together, and you go over and over. Those of you that have that have mastered the martial arts, you know, it's just over and over until these things literally become intuitive. Sword no sword, as the Japanese talk about it. You do it without conscious without conscious thought. So your eyes are open all the time and observing. So that's why observe, then orient, then decide and act doesn't work when you actually because you're observing all of the time. You're orient. In fact, the difference between observation and orientation. They're the same thing when you're actually engaged. And actions are flowing quickly and intuitively if you're in a group implicitly. Implicit refers to how, how uh, things are communicated. Intuitive refers to how they're originated. In other words, intuitive is in here. Mm -hmm. And then when I communicate, uh, that's implicit or explicit. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, all this stuff is going on. How do we make it happen? And it's more and more complex training and, and more and more in, uncertain uh, situation against better and better opponents. And again, if you've had martial arts, this, this, this is all this is all you know a karate 101 stuff. Oddly enough, in the military, it took a long time to, to seek in, even though a lot of people in the military take martial arts. Now here's the key. Uh -huh. You're typically not doing it as an individual in a military situation. As Patton said, all that individuality stuff pile of crap. And he actually said that by the way. That that speech in the movie is actually based on the number of talks that he actually gave. He said, army eats, lives, sleep, fights, what da, da, as a team. And that is exactly correct. That's why that harmony and initiative is so important. You as the great general may know exactly what to do and issue all the orders to make it happen. 
and then nothing happens. That happened over and over. That plagued Grant during the Civil during the Civil War. He couldn't get anybody to carry out his orders. What he wanted his orders carried out. Once he finally got his own people, Sherman, uh, Sheridan, those kind of folks in place, then things happened very things happened very quickly and very fast. But when he had these political generals like Butler and that to, to work with, he'd give an order down. And it's I don't think so. <laughs> and that was that. There was nothing he could do because it's called coming out of the world. So getting getting your overall scheme to actually happen is an, is another big piece of Boyd's uh, Boyd's methodology. And that's really interesting because as a fighter pilot, he didn't really ever have to do that. He never commanded a squadron or a fighter uh, unit or that sort of thing. So he relied on a lot of observation and talking with people, including a blitzkrieg officers. Air Force commanders, uh, Army guys, and at the Pentagon, of course, he had access to all of you. He, he could walk down and talk to anybody, anybody that would talk to him, and and try to get this 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 sense for how it worked. And that's why he came up with that Blitzkrieg climate, the really five German rules. And the first one, the most important one, is Einheit, which he translated as mutual trust. If you know German, the word literally means oneness, something like that, unity, cohesion. It's sort of what happens, what we do inside the unit with ourselves is more important than what we do to the people on the outside. The unit as a self will operate against people on the outside. But what's really important is, is diminishing friction on the inside so that stuff that we want to happen actually happens. There's entropy again. Entropy is not the same thing as friction, but, but you understand there's energy there that can't be used to do what the organization needs to do. Entropy. So he said, the, the way you do this is you have to set up an uh, organizational climate that has certain characteristics. And there's a lot of them out there, but every one of them um, has these, these, five, these five principles or something that looks a lot like them. Some of them say, trust you'll find in virtually every organizational uh -huh. um, you know, climate that, that's out there. Everybody, you know, you know, trust is good might be a, might be a good thing. And, and it is. It's, a, it's an immeasurable, uh, to use the language of Zen Buddhism. Uh -huh. uh, and in, in the sense that you almost never have too much of it. You're always working to improve it. Um, the next thing that comes on is, okay, now we have this all this trust. What are we going to do with it? Well, there's there's three three uh, tools to take over from there. The first apl applies to individuals. The first says, okay, we got all this trust, but gee, it'd really be nice if like you actually could hit something with your rifle when you point it downrange. Mm -hmm. And it'd be nice if you're a platoon leader or a company commander, if you actually knew how to issue orders, you had uh, a, a, a sense of how things are going, how your training is going, how morale is going. Are people under too much stress? Do you need to rotate people out? And he called this ability, this, this magical ability to do your job in a way that an outsider literally would find magical. He called it Fingerspitzengefühl from the German word for, fingers, for fingertip feeling, which is a word the Germans used, incidentally. The, Rama was to ha supposed to have this mystical ability to read the battle, and they call that Fingerspitzengefühl. Um, and I think that's, that's kind of what made it popular. Okay, so we've got all this, this competence and we, uh, in, in doing our job and we've got all this trust together. We know the other guy's got our back and, and we know they're not gonna break and run and leave us exposed and, and killed or captured or all that kind of stuff. We're gonna fight to the last bullet. They're gonna fight to the last bullet. And if they have two bullets, they'll give one of them to us. So that, you know, that kind of, that, that's what we're talking about. All right, so how do you focus this now? How do you get it going? Well, the first thing is, it'd be nice if you had a focus. If you're going to focus something, you know, focus to do what? What is it we're trying to accomplish? As uh, uh, Stephen Bungay, uh, quoting those great military strategists, the Spice Girls, once <laughs> said, tell me what you want, what you really, really want. You can Google that. It's a great song. That's not the name of the song, but that's the, that's the name, uh, name. Tell me what you want, what you really, really want. That's what, tell me what it is you want to happen. And then the second one is, let me go do it. Alf Trog's tactic, mission command, mission control. Read me out the whole situation, what we're trying to accomplish. Tell me what it is that you want me to accomplish and then get out of my way. Well, not really get out of my way, but make sure that I get what I need. You know, keep fly, supplies flowing in my direction. Keep, keep higher command off of me. Mike Wally used to say that was his main function as a, as a company commander was to keep the battalion commander and higher away from his company. Uh, and if you've ever been in the military or even in any bureaucratic civilian organization, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And so you got these four internal components, as it were, Einheit, Fingerspitz, and Gefühl, Auftrags, Taktik, Schwerpunkt, EFAS, 
and by the way, it doesn't make any order. I like to start with finger spits and get real quick. Once people get start getting pride in how well they do things, a lot of this defensiveness that kills mutual trust, the CYA goes away. So I think if you start with finger spits and get through, then go to Einheit and then start practicing using Spherofunk and Alftrog to, to um, shape it. Uh, that's not a bad way to have it go. The final one is a behindic kite. If you put it into Google Translate, it comes out as agility. But what Boyd really meant was mental agility in the sense of what uh, Srikant was just talking about with destruction and creation. You got this mental model. Uh, but you know, all mental models eventually degrade. You can tweak them, but, and Chuck Spinney, by the way, and I have a link on my site uh, to his um, evolutionary epistemology illustrates this beautifully with the evolution of our model of the solar system. Remember, we started out with the Ptolemaic system. There were models, I'm sure, before that. They just weren't written down. People have been looking up the sky ever since they could look and there was a sky. Uh, but they had this Ptolemaic system, which put the Earth in the center of the universe. You want to get really technical the temple at Jerusalem right in the center of that. And then everything else rotated around it in spheres. Didn't say whether it was round or flat. The Greeks knew it was round and it's pretty easy. You can tell that because you watch ships go over or of course the famous experiment, you drill two holes in different places and at noon the sun shines at a different angle between them. That's how they figured out. They, they got a pretty good estimate of the, um, of the, of, the uh, of the size of the earth. But anyway, it sits here and these things rotate around them, these spheres, these crystal spheres, and the sun sits in one and the moon sits in another and the planets, they have what, five, they, they recognize them, Mercury, Venus, uh, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn that you could see with your naked eye. Uh, earth wasn't a planet because it's sitting in the middle of this. And these spheres rotate around, carrying the planets with them, and everything is harmonized, and you have the music of the spheres, except anybody that's ever watched planets for any length of time knows that's not how it works. Because the planet doesn't seem to just kind of move this way through the sky. If you look at Jupiter or Mars, it'll seem to go this way, and then after a while, it'll seem to come back this way, it'll disappear for a while behind the sun, and it'll come out. It's doing all this weird stuff. And so they said, well, no problem. It turns out that, these, that these, these spheres actually have little spheres inside them with little gears, and they call these epicycles. And, they're, and so as they rotate inside the big sphere, that allows Mars and Jupiter. And it turns out by making precise uh, observations, uh, you could determine exactly how many gears you needed inside these epicycles so that it would mirror the action of the planets we actually saw. You could make pretty accurate predictions that way. Except when we got really, really good observations from Tycho Brahe, uh, uh, the Danish nobleman in, in, the, uh, in his observatory, it turns out there were, there were noblemen back then that did astronomy and biology and all that as hobbies. Don't worry about it. But anyway, he, made, he, he was a believer in the Ptolemaic system, but he, he made these tremendously uh, accurate observations of the motions of the celestial bodies so that we could maybe put another epicycle inside of this epicycle to correct that epicycle. And, and they got pretty accurate um, pretty right it modeled that, but pretty soon you had epicycles and side epicycles and all, and then you couldn't explain comets, you couldn't, meteors, all that kind of stuff. A meteors they explained, that was God throwing rocks at the earth. Nobody knew exactly what a comet was. Uh, and of course you couldn't, didn't have these fuzzy objects in the sky. We had no idea what they were. You can see the great nebula in Andromeda, of course, if you've got decent eyes um, uh, on any good, fairly dark night. If you haven't done that, I recommend it, by the way. The thing is heading straight for us. Uh, it's going to obliterate or it's going to join with the Milky Way here in a few years, two and a half billion. But it's amazing. The thing, by the way, here's, a, here's a, the great nebula in Andromeda. If you could see the whole thing, if, you, if it was a really dark uh, night and you had really good vision, it would be bigger than the moon. Mm -hmm. Two and a half times the size of the moon. Anyway, finally Copernicus came out uh, drawing on the observations of Tycho Brahe and the uh, uh, work of people like Johannes Kepler. And he said, look, it would be a lot simpler if you put the sun in the middle of it and use Kepler's laws to have the, the, the planets going around them in these elliptical uh, paths. And if you do that, it's much more accurate than, this, than all this, this epicycle nonsense. Uh, it's much easier to compute. Schoolboy can do it with a little bit of practice. And it is wonderfully predictive, much more accurate. 
And of course, it, it took a while for that to catch on, let's put it that way. But because it was so accurate, it was so easy to do. Well, it really wasn't that long, maybe 150 years. And it, it pretty much, with the exception of a very small group of people today, pretty much uh, uh, is uh, totally caught on. So we had the Ptolemaic mental model, then got replaced with the Copernican mental model. And, and that worked really, really well. Uh, it was refined by Newton, Newton's laws of motion, uh, you know, explained, explained Kepler very, very well. And everything motored along real, real well until uh, Einstein came along with relativity and also with quantum mechanics, because you know he got his, his, his Nobel Prize for quantum mechanics, not relativity. And it was um, that said, well, yes, pretty accurate, but it's not, still not accurate enough. And so relativity and quantum mechanics came in and they refined, replaced whatever the Newtonian model. So he got uh, the middle model replaced by mental model replaced by, depending on how you do quantum mechanics and relativity, more mental models. And of course we couldn't have GPS today if we didn't have relativity. Uh, couldn't have, have quantum mechanics either, but I mean, our GPS system just would not work unless you made the corrections that uh, a special relativity says you need to make. So uh, a little practical thing right there. So what's going on now? People are spotting mismatches. They're looking at what they have now. They're basically ripping it apart. In other words, the Copernican model was not a refinement of the Ptolemaic model. It was, it was a ripping apart of the Ptolemaic model and its replacement by another mindset. To some extent, the others have been refinements on the Copernican model, although it's hard, I'm not sure how you do quantum mechanics. I mean, I'm not a physicist, but, but what Feynman said about quantum mechanics seems to be right. He said, if you think you understand quantum mechanics, that proves you don't understand quantum mechanics. And a little of it, I've tried to understand it, that may be true, but I've seen that from people who, 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 who are, uh, apparently are very good at it. So we're not really sure how those models, and then of course you'd like to unify relativity and quantum mechanics and that's still going on. Uh, so there's still a lot of paradigm work still, still to be done. But if you apply that to yourself, if you have this model of, of uh, for example, how the automobile industry works and, and, you, and your General Motors, and your model is uh, keep chopping costs, keep making them, keep bringing my cost down, make more and more and more of them at lower and lower costs. Don't worry about the quality because it'll be good enough. People buy it anyway and we'll fix what's bad. And you can have a whole bunch of different models all at one time. And furthermore, it turns out that if you're General Motors, you can say, well, you know, like we, we'll make a, a, a Cadillac higher quality, but it's still made it on a production line. We still have to buy all this stuff. And so the question is how much bad quality will a Cadillac de, uh, uh, owner accept before they buy a Lincoln or God forbid buy a Mercedes. And they actually quantified that. What Toyota said, the paradigm, it said, quality is uh, poor quality is waste. Our system is designed to drive out waste. There is no such thing as acceptable level of quality. Well, that would, if you tried to apply that to a Cadillac and the way drone motors made them, it'd make the thing uh, tremendously expensive and you still couldn't inspect out all of the errors. I'm not gonna bore you with the Toyota production system here. Let's just say it was a complete paradigm shift in how things are made that's still going on today. Very much as Boyd, uh, as Boyd predicted. They, spot, they found mismatches, they, they evolved. In fact, they say they evolved the Ford system uh, into a completely different way of, uh, of making things. And to see that it's different, the heart of the operation of the Toyota production system are the famous Kanban, the cards. Kanban in the general motor system would be 100% waste. <laughs> that do anything for you, you know. It's just the cards are piling up, but you're you're carrying out the instructions issued you by by a central uh, um, uh, a production control uh, organization, and these things are coming down the line. You got X number of seconds to put something on, and then it goes to the next one, whether it's right or not. There's no way to stop the line like you can in the Toyota. Mm -hmm. So it's a completely different paradigm, but it was evolved using principles of conceptual spiral. Absolutely. I mean, I, the thing I like about the conceptual spiral is that it takes uh, it takes the core ideas of Boyd. And what he does is that he shows that the same processes are working in science, like you, you talked about. And they're the same processes that are working in technology. Like for example, if you're producing iPhones or any kind of phones, yes, you design the best you can and you put it out there. As soon as you put it out, you look for, okay, how can I make it better? Anybody who does not do that is sunk. So the idea of kind of being open to mismatches, actually looking for them, because most people 
their psychology is, is that they want to hold on to whatever it is that they have done in the marginal line mentality that we yes. talked about earlier and it yeah. fell to the blitzkrieg yeah so um so i think conceptual spiral is very um accessible now can we go or shall i bring up the uh, diagram of the uda loop and sure, we can right ahead. i'd like to say one thing by the way while you're doing this uh the um the ultimate of that i think was suggested by tom peters who who met boyd read all boyd stuff and all of that and he said you know what you should really do to really uh, want to keep yourself uh, uh, competitive is as soon as you invent something or or uh, create something, immediately license it to anybody that wants and move on. Uh, because they said if you don't do that, then basically you know part of your R and D department is waste. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you keep your R and D department going if as soon as you and they said at the very least you'll make money off the of licensing. Yes. Otherwise, you go brain dead. You start trying to defend what you did last year, and you, and you provide a competitive opening for somebody else. Okay. First thing to notice here is that orientation is the biggest block, and it's also the only one that we colored in. Because everything is about orientation. Everything flows out of orientation. The orientation, your mental model, is what he talks about in destruction and creation. He said we have mental models that, that create uh, our... Uh, a basis for decisions. All a decision does is it selects an action. That's its only purpose. Uh, if you uh, can select your actions some other way, for example, that implicit guidance and control feed uh, from orientation to action, the decisions are actually made inside orientation. Um, but anyway, so orientation is the key. Orientation the middle model of the world. Uh, modern physiology suggests that most of the neural activity takes place in the prefrontal cortex right in the front part of the game, but not all of it. Because the frontal cortex got nerve threads going all through the, through the body. And, uh, but apparently that's the part that lights up when you're trying to do rational decision-making. Okay, well, that's really good. Uh, so, we, so we said, well, what keeps our, how do we know that we're, that we're pumping out good actions over here? How do we know our orientation is accurate? And that gets back to the uh, thing that, uh, that that Srikant talked about. We've got to be observing here all the time. And one of the things we're looking for is mismatches because the mismatch says our orientation may not be working that well. Now, in the real world, everything is statistical, of course. You get a mismatch, it might be orientation is still okay. Um, it just happened, this just happened to be an outlier. But then that's part of your orientation. How do you find out? How do you know how far out uh, are we in a, you know, one of these fat tail distributions that, uh, that Talib likes so much? Well, you better know because if your kind of actions that are appropriate in a fat tail distribution is a lot different than the kind of actions appropriate for a nice Gaussian with a big hump and a, and a, and a nice uh, uh, a mean equals median equals mode right in the middle. Uh, and all that's a part of orientation. All that's a part of observation. So you're, you're looking at all this stuff. You're gathering stuff from the outside world. You're trying to find out what it means. Uh, Look at this at this at the at the uh, at the decision action test thing. One of the ways you decide that is you do what Sun Tzu and Boyd uh, call probe and test. Uh, you don't just observe, but you stick stuff out there into the environment and you observe what happens. And that is ex uh, extremely important uh, way to program your orientation. Uh, it's how the scientific method works. Hypothesis test, hypothesis experiment, conclusion from that, revise your mental model, come up with another experiment, carry it out, look at the results, revise your mental model or not, as appropriate. And uh, as you're doing all of this, you're revising your mental model, but if what you're testing is also potential actions, you're also uh, adding items to your implicit repertoire. In other words, as you train with these things, you're learning new actions, maybe even new weapons, but you're also programming your orientation to be able to use those weapons by going around and around and around through that true OODA loop, observe, orient, decide, and act. But as you're going through it, your orientation is changing and your, and your set of actions that you can use is also changing. And that's how you keep coming up with new implicit repertoire, because if you don't, people are going to figure you out. And if they figure you out, they'll figure out some way to exploit your weakness. So, that, which is why, uh, incidentally, uh, uh, you, uh, you always want to keep doing new things. You want to keep preserving your capacity for independent action, which, if you think about it, implies novelty. Because if other people start 
restricting your capacity for independent action. If, if they start controlling you, you may not like what they do with you. And to Boyd, that was an absolute anathema, as it is to Toyota, by the way. Toyota says the purpose of our system ultimately is for us to take charge of our own destiny. We're not going to be bounced around by external forces. We're going to be in charge. And when I read that to Boyd the first time, he said, you know, if I were going to buy another car, I'd definitely buy a Toyota, but my car buying days are over. <laughs> so, he really liked that. In charge of our own destiny, preserve our capacity for independent action. Because if you don't, then you'll find your, your capacity for action is going to get locked in and you're going to have less and less ability to deal with the rapidly changing environment. And at some point, you're going to be dead. Or at least you're going to be so irrelevant that people aren't going to care about you. So preserving your capacity for independent action goes all the way back to destruction and creation is a, is a theme that runs all through this. And the way that you do that is summarized in this little OODA loop diagram. It's an ancient idea. And again, if you go back and look at the ancient text of, um, of Buddhism, for example, you find that runs off of purposes then is to develop a, uh, uh, is, is to see reality as it is, for example. Um, in the Yoga Sutras, which uh, date back to who knows when, about that same period, the very third thing of the yoga, uh, uh, sorry, the very second Yoga Sutra is the purpose of yoga is to remove the imperfections of the mind. In other words, the things that keep us from being able to see clearly, we're going to remove those, and that's the purpose of yoga. You probably thought it was stretching or some kind of weird contortions. So did I when I got into it. But so it's an ancient, ancient idea of, of the side that has the best clearest picture of what's going on and has done the hard work beforehand to have some tools that they can use to influence that clear picture, exploit that clear picture is the one that's going to win. That's more in a nutshell. So, I have one question because the orientation is the heart of the whole, uh, the whole diagram. Careful. So yeah, let's yeah. focus a little bit on orientation. Can you talk about these various parts? Of we had more fun with those. Uh, Boyd at one time, uh, by the way, that, that a pentagram in the middle was not there in the original. He had, he, they were just blobs. Uh, that's kind of cool. Uh, the, uh, he, we went back and forth on what those ought to be and, and whether there should be arrows going between them and whether some of the arrows should be thick or thin, some of the arrows should be dotted or solid. And finally, Boyd just said, make them all the same length, put uh, links between any two of them and let's go on. Because you see, a genetic heritage has given us a lot of problems. When you're talking about individuals, you're talking about things like lysenko. You can seem like you're talking about lysenkoism, you know, that inherit that uh, uh, learned traits can be inherited. Turns out with epigenetics now, it's maybe not quite as clear as it was back then. The DNA does not, as far as we can tell, in, in, inherit learned actions, but there are other parts to the inheritance uh, um, system that perhaps can. But anyway, this was this was came out long after Boyd. So Boyd, not sure that he wanted an arrow from previous experience back to genetic heritage, because uh, that would be uh, a lysenkoism. So he said, I just don't want to get into it. Let's just, uh, and then, but when you come to groups of people and you have that genetic heritage in there, now you get yourself in real trouble, because now if you're not careful, you end up talking about racism. That's not what Boyd had in mind at all. This is, this is, this is just, people are different, uh, our DNA is different and that we act differently. We may see the world differently just because we're wired differently. That's it. That's, that's the total function of putting genetic heritage in there. Mm -hmm. Some think people are taller than others. Maybe they become better basketball players. They're shorter than others. Maybe they become better gymnasts, you know, whatever. Um, genetic heritage definitely influence all this. The others, I think you can see down there are pretty, are pretty straightforward. Notice he put analysis and synthesis in there. And that was fairly late. If you go back and look at how he was describing this stuff, uh, even back in organic design, when he first started talking about orientation, it didn't have that analysis and synthesis block in it. Um, and, and later on, he because you could think of analysis and synthesis as being a, a, a form of action. But uh, after thinking about it a long time and coming up with conceptual spiral, uh, which has that analysis and synthesis block in it. In fact, if you look at conceptual spiral, the very first version of science and technology doesn't have it. The second version of it does have it. And then when he actually drew the diagram in his next briefing about uh, three years later, uh, Essence of Winning and Losing, uh, this is what came out. So uh, you may come up with other things inside that block, but it's essentially whatever goes on inside your mental models that govern what actions you select and how you perform them. So whatever you want to stick in there, be my guest. Oh, my only a quick, my only uh, uh, 
request if you want to mess around with OODA a little bit, don't make it more complicated than it already is, please. <laughs> we need a simplification of the thing, but nobody's been able to come up with a good one yet. So well, anyhow, that's all I can say really about the OODA loop. Anybody have any questions or thoughts yes. I'd, in, the, in 38 seconds we have left? We got a little time left. Yes. 15 seconds left. Uh, I'd be happy to consider them. Wonderful. So uh, folks, uh, so we're going to uh, do Q&A now. Uh, first question is from Jeff. Uh, anybody who wants to ask questions, we've got four rules as usual. Go ahead and type exclamation mark in chat. Um, keep your questions brief, keep it on topic. Uh, and go ahead, Jeff, you're next. Great. Uh, so thanks for the uh, really helpful uh, comments, both uh, Srikant and Chet. Um, I think my, uh, my question was uh, in relation to um, the, um, I, I can't pronounce it, but it's sort of like the intuitive feel. Um, fingers, um, fingers. Fingers, yeah, that one. Um, uh, <laughs> and um, I think the relationship between that and metrics in business, I think mm. that in your certain to win, you talk about, hey, goals are maybe not a good use case uh, for metrics, but uh, I see a lot of cases where organizations will use metrics to say like, hey, how is, it, how is business? And they'll still have a big dashboard that sort of uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. has one of the inputs associated with it. And so I just wanted to understand, um, do you think it is, is there a place for that in that sort of uh, intuitive feel for what's going on? If yeah, so, yeah. like what are the principles that uh, sort of operate its, oper uh, operate, uh, its good performance? That is a really, really, really good question. Uh, and I think it all comes down to, um, you're going to have metrics, whether you whether you, they're all intuitive. Or not. I mean, ideally, you'd like to do something like the Ono circle, or uh, where you draw a circle in your factory and you just stand there going um or whatever, <laughs> and you're uh, just absorbing the input around you, and you can tell you know, how well it's doing just by listening to the uh, to the sounds of the line uh, and the people talking and 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 the level light and all. But that's great. Toy Ono in invented the system, you know, and worked at it for however many years. Um, and there's a lot to be said for that. Um, on the other hand, uh, there's a lot to be said for saying, all right, how many, you know, if we're saying we're improving, and the whole purpose of the Toyota system is to constantly improve in the sense that it manipulates a specific time factor, the time between customer order and customer delivery with the uh, um, stipulation that you cannot build uh, um, inventory for the purposes of, uh, of influencing. In other words, you can't build up stock at the end and sell from stock. Um, and it, it, that just kills the whole system. In other words, you have to deliver the customer orders, your system makes it, you deliver it. And it turns out that's an excellent, excellent metric because as you, if you have to pull something out and inspect it and fix it, boy, your time to deliver starts going up. So you can see how it quickly begins to measure the overall health of the system in a very fundamental way. And it isn't just how, how long it takes, it's, it's to constantly improve how long that it takes. Well, how do you know? So you gotta start measuring. We have to measure that one if nothing else. And then you might wanna know, well, what are some of the components of this? It's from the time he puts the order in till the time that it, that it enters our system till we, till we know to make that car for them. Uh, how long does that take? Is that, you know, what's that component of it? Is it getting better? Is it getting worse? How accurate, how often do we screw it up? How often if he, if he puts something in, uh, and it goes to the production line. That's not what he actually, uh, you know, what you know what he actually ordered. Um, and so, you know, those kind of things. And even though Toyota, you know, prides itself on great quality, it's not perfect. They had a big scandal back in early, uh, early part of this um, of this century where the quality started to go to hell. In fact, they got bumped off of the uh, a Consumer Reports automatically, you know, automatically recommended list, but uh, uh, due to quality problems. And so. You know, you, you can gather metrics, you can gather data, it's probably a better way, I think, like to say it, on all of this kind of good stuff. Now, where finger spits and fuel comes in is, is twofold. The first is what data to gather. There's an infinite amount of data out there you could gather. And the second is, okay, now we got this data, what do we do with it? And that's where the finger spits and get fuel really, what are the data trying to tell us? And that's the, uh, that's the real magic uh, key, really understanding. Now, there is an interesting thing out there, if I can remember the name of it, some of y'all may be able to help me out there, uh, um, Schuhart's, Schuhart's Law. I think that's, that's not quite right, but it's very close. It basically says once a metric becomes a, a, a goal or objective, it ceases to be a valid metric. In other words, if you say, all right, gosh, you know, it takes us 18 hours now to build a car, so we're going to set a goal for 
17 hours and 30 minutes. At that point then, measuring how long it takes to, uh, to build a car becomes worthless, becomes useless. Why is that? Everybody knows you eight to 17 hours and 30 minutes and they will make it happen. And they may not make it happen in ways that you like, but once you told them that's your goal, that's what I'm gonna be measuring you on. That's what bonuses and promotions and all that are gonna be based on. Uh, you can better believe they will, they will measure it, which is why qu quotas in selling are such a, a controversial, um, controversial metric. Obviously, how much you sold is a metric, whether you like it or not. Once you set a quota, now you're inviting people to gain the system. And there's, if you've ever been into sales, there's just infinite number of ways to do that. So you need another metric then. If, if you're gonna set sales quotas, you need some other metric to know how well your sales organization is doing. And I'll leave that for you to come up with how to, how to do it, how, how many phone calls they're making, uh, how many phone calls I'm getting that uh, I got the salesman con me. I mean, I don't know, uh, but there's, there, there are ways you can measure anything. The question is, what do you do with it when you get it? Uh, James, uh, Jim Collins in his book, uh, a good to great, I think has some really, really good ideas uh, on that. So I'll, I'll, I'll send those over to you. But uh, yeah, uh, finger spitzing a fool is, and, and metrics can work together extremely, extremely well. Uh, the trick being use your finger spitzing a fool to understand what the metrics are trying to say to you. Wonderful. That's the best you. answer that I can give you. If you think about it, you can probably come up with other ways uh, to use it too. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chad. Uh, and thank you, Jeff. Uh, next up is going to be Rob, Christian, and uh, Pegor. Rob. Rob. I'm really enjoying this. Oh, hey, Rob. I, I, I think Shrikant may have overbilled earlier my, my knowledge of, of Boyd and the Oda Loop. But on the other hand, I already knew how, I already knew how to pronounce Schwerpunkt and Finger Spitzing Gefühl. So I figure out. miles ahead of, you're miles ahead of everybody else. What do you mean? Okay. Go good. Uh, yeah, you know, it, it's it's one of those words I like to I like to pull out that uh, that nobody knows, but it's it's hugely useful. Yes. Uh, well, I, I I apologize. This was covered. I was out for a little bit. I apologize if this was covered, but I I find it very interesting the way that Boyd seems to have anticipated some aspects of what we now call asymmetric warfare. Mm. And, you know, insurgency and counterinsurgency. And if I could also throw in, um, speaking of insurgency, my main field is politics. Oh, all right. And the last You're having a lot of fun right now, aren't you? Well, the last five years generally feels to me like somebody got out of control of their OODA loop. Like, you know, the, <laughs> the responses of the system were not keeping up with the changes and the unexpected things that were happening. So I think it's like a, a massive uh, example of not having a proper OODA loop in our, our political system. Yeah, you remind me of the top brass of CNN who all went out and voted for Trump. <laughs> because the thought of not having him for four more years was more than they could stand. <laughs> anyway, what's your question? What can I do for you? Oh, so I wanted to have you expand on if, if you haven't Ooh, covered it. Oh, already. yes, absolutely. You, you oh, absolutely. Be, Boyd once talked about before. the difference between regular and irregular warfare. And he said, why would you ever fight regular war? You know, that just didn't make any sense. And his whole point about uh, causing uh, uh, change and exploiting it implies a lot of irregularity. Now, having said all that, he came up with two, two basic ways of, of doing it. And he said, th these are just illustrations. The Blitzkrieg was one and guerrilla warfare was the, uh, was the other. And of course they can work together. You can have guerrillas as the, as the partisans did and the German uh, um, special operations did uh, working out in front of your guerrilla, of your, um, of your Blitzkrieg. But yeah, uh, he has a large section in Patterns of Conflict around page, Pull it out 65, maybe Soviet revolutionary tactics and then guerrilla warfare and how they work together. Uh, and it all comes down to that um, the tactics that were used from the Civil War up through the end of World War I uh, just, just couldn't be used anymore. I mean, and we, we knew that going into World War I, but for a variety of reasons, uh, they, they still employed them. Weapons were just too lethal. Uh, up until about 1840, you know, there were smoothbore muskets and, 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 and the, the balls themselves were, were literally musket balls. So you, you know, you rammed them down, you fired them off. Things went out very fast. If they hit you within the first 70 to maybe 100 yards, they'd do a severe amount of damage. But as they were going out, they were, they were, they were basically knuckleballs. They were doing this. <laughs> and so beyond about 70 yards, they bled off a lot of energy and also the accuracy went to hell. <clears throat> So linear tactics were possible back then. You could, you could get to within about 70 yards of the enemy 
You could fire your muskets, fix bayonets, and run like mad. They would get one shot off at you, but before they could reload and fire again, you'd be in on top of them. And, and that was the standard infantry tactic from the invention of gunpowder up until, unfortunately, World War I. Now, a lot of World War I gets a bad, a bad rap. People were smart enough to know that you could not walk up and confront a machine guns and hope to survive. You couldn't hope to, uh, uh, to confront Springfield rifles because that 70 uh, yards not got, now got replaced by 200, 300, maybe even 400 yards, or in the case of snipers, even further than that. But mass, mass fire easily out to 400 yards. Plus, you didn't have to swab the thing down, roll another ball down, and put another round in, click, click, and shoot. So the breech loader, whether it was semi-automatic, full automatic, or, or manual, just threw too much and too accurate lead out. So they needed something else. Now, again, the people weren't stupid. They tried all kinds of stuff. They tried massive artillery preparations. They tried walking their own machine guns forward. They tried poison gas to obliterate. The, and the purpose of poison gas wasn't necessary to kill people. It was forcing them to get, to, to get down, also to put on their gas masks when they couldn't see anything. And they killed a few people so much the better. Um, unfortunately, uh, given the nature of wind, a lot of that poison gas blew back on the trendy side. So you wound up charging forward with your gas mask almost meant you couldn't see anything either. <laughs> the solution that, uh, that they came was the Blitzkrieg on the one side of it, which is infiltration tactics with, with, with armor, and the other side was highly irregular warfare. Uh, in fact, Boyd points out that even in regular warfare, they had highly irregular elements. So for example, you think of Napoleon with the Imperial Guard, and they're in their columns, and they're, they're beating the drums away. In the center of every column was some kid beating the drum, they call it the pas de charge. Anyway, they're, and they're coming forward and they'll take their losses around the front and then they'll charge through and they'll, they'll, bend it, they'll get around the back and at everybody. Okay, but even with all that, they had people out in front. They had two classes out and they had, remember the name, they had Voltigeurs and uh, uh, Grenadiers. And these were irregular troops. The, the famous red coats also had green coats. If you watched a sharp, any of the sharp stuff, he was a green coat, he was a rifleman. Their function was to get out in front irregularly and pick off people, preferably officers if they could, NCOs, start picking people off and before their line then had a chance to come, chance to come forward because a lot of these people were, were executing this on command and if you kill the guy making the command, kind of screwed everything up. Um, so irregular plus, plus regular. But the, what, what John said is where they got it wrong was they were using the irregular forces as, as kind of you know, they're not really that important. And they were using the regular then was going to be the arm of decision. He said, if you go back and look at forces like, uh, like Alexander and all of that, the, really the, the form of decision was the irregular. That got everything messed up. And then all you had to do was exploit. So the companion cavalry, he goes into this and this thing. Whole function of the rest of that battlefield and Alexander didn't really care how many people he lost in the process was to get that few hundred horsemen to, uh, uh, through a weak point in the Persian line and head for Darius. You can tell what was happening with the other 100,000 people on the battle, because once Darius left the battlefield, the, the battle was over and that's how it turned out. So this playoff of regular versus irregular is, is, is ancient. And Boyd really came down on the regular side. He really like, that's Sun Tzu, you know, win without fighting. Uh, you know, do something the other guy couldn't figure out and exploit it before they could. So the very good question. Uh, yeah, one of these days, get an opportunity to go through patterns of conflict. Keep that, keep that in the back of your mind as you're as you're reading through it. But yeah, Boyd loved bottoms up. He loved irregular. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, next up is going to be Christian, Pegor, and Mike. Christian. Hi. Uh, yes. Uh, so I have a bit of a. It's almost like a meta question about the OODA loop. Okay. I wonder when when applying it in an organization, how how can an organization do this without the OODA loop itself becoming dogmatized to the point of being sort of like something that is applied robotically rather than something that everyone has an implicit understanding of. I, I feel this sort yeah, of danger well, when I'm seeing question. a diagram like that. That's a real good question because, you know, boy hated dogma. He even hated doctrine. He said doctrine on day one, uh, dogma on day two. Unfortunately, I think it's accepted now that you need a certain amount of doctrine, which is explicit stuff we all agree on. So we don't have to keep reinventing the wheel every time. Um, and that's, 
that can be a component, as I, I try to say in boy drill in my paper, boy drill oodle loop. That can be a strong component of your of your group orientation. Let's write down what we agree on right now. Toyota calls that standard work. We also agree that it's just what we agree on right now. Now, the big problem is keeping that from becoming dogma. From people saying, you can't do that, it's not in the standard work. The correct thing is try it and see. If it's better than what's in the standard work, then we'll replace the standard work. And which is how the Toyota system is supposed to work. Um, it's difficult when, when you're as big as Toyota is and have as many people on it to get it to actually work that way. The Marine Corps had a great start. They had the uh, uh, MCDP-1, the Maneuver Warfare uh, Handbook called War Fighting. And if you, if you Google MCDP-1, you can still find it. And um, uh, you Google FMFM-1-1, FMFM-1, Fleet Marine Field Manual 1. Then in, that was in 89. And then in 97, only eight years later, they replaced it with an um, improved version called MCDP-1, also called War Fighting. That was the last version of it that's come out. That was 1989. <laughs> Come on, guys. You know, it was 32 years ago. That's the carry the one. You know, God, I can't believe it's been that long. Is that right? Yeah, 30 years plus 1989, 2019. So you can see it, exactly what you said happened to the Marine Corps. Uh, anywhere there are groups of human beings involved, I don't know a way to keep it from, absolutely keep it from happening. Um, I mean, the top people can all thunder and say, you know, yeah, we're going we're gonna to revise our our orientations, we're gonna revise our doctrine and all of that. But until you put in mechanisms to make it happen, and still you start rewarding people for the improvements that they make to doctrine. Again, I think, I don't know if you all ever read uh, um, um, Isaac, uh, Isaac uh, Asimov's Foundation Trilogy. You have to remember the way people got, became there, how they got ahead was they had this huge model that according to Boyd couldn't, couldn't it really exist as a huge model, but it didn't accurately, totally, in best way, it didn't accurately reflect the whole universe. So people who were able to look at this huge model and make changes to it, make improvements to it, they were the ones that got ahead and they got rewarded for it. So far as I can tell, nobody in the Marine Corps has been rewarded since 1989 for making an improvement to the warfighting manual. So, and part of it, I think, is that peace broke out. And um, I mean, since 1997, peace broke out in 1990. Soviet Union disappeared as a uh, as an adversary, and despite our absolute best efforts, we haven't been able to, to resuscitate a Russia and, for that matter, China as as adversaries. Because you know, once nuclear weapons are invented, people have a hard time believing there's going to be a replay of World War II anytime soon. Saddam Hussein would still be alive and in power today if he had had a couple of nukes, because we wouldn't have dare put those troops uh, uh, down in Dalaran and in uh, um, and massed them all up and, and, and had them go invade uh, Iraq. Saudi Arabia would never have let us in if they knew that Saddam Hussein had a couple, three or four um, uh, uh, deliverable nuclear weapons. Um, because, the, I mean, I was in Riyadh when the Scuds landed. It was a big deal. You went out, you watched the Scuds, you watched the Patriots go up, boom, boom, the Patriots got the Scuds. Then you watched the warhead fall to the ground and go, boom. It just hit a different part of Riyadh than it would have hit if you hadn't had the Patriots. If that had been a nuclear war here to hit the war, it would have got a lot more than boom, and the Saudis weren't going to. So things would have been so much different, nuclear weapons. Um, so Boyd, I think, lost a lot of interest in how to do this stuff in, uh, in the military sense, and so did the Marine Corps. And I think that that accounts for why the Marines were unable to, to improve there, why it became dogma uh, from 1997 on. And even the Marines today will tell you, yeah, we're doing maneuver warfare as best we can, but we're maybe halfway there if we're that far. They have a, fortunately, to their, to their great credit, they have a big discussion going on in the Marine Corps right now about, uh, you know, about this. I wish I could give you a good answer. It's uh, partly a leadership problem. It's partly a human nature problem. It's partly a what competitive environment are you in problem. Marines not being, the only people the Marines really compete against right now are they're only in the Navy. Um, and, and it's been that way for years. But if you look at, uh, if you look at, for example, when the Japanese, when they were in really, really, really racking up points, they were taking market share away from General Motorsport and, and, and Chrysler every year. They had 12 companies producing cars and exporting to the United States. There was a time I could name all 12 of them. Uh, we had three at that, at that time, major, uh, major automobiles. We had an oligopoly and they had a highly competitive environment. So they were motivated. Uh, to, to make sure that they didn't let their orientation block up, because if they did, if they turned out a product that wasn't that you know wasn't going to sell, then um, they started losing market share very very quickly. 
So I think you know the competitive environment, the um, the um, amount of uh, that that this stuff is shared within your company, so that everybody knows we, the, that that we can't get locked into the dogma. The way people are promoted for making improvements to it, for ensuring we're not going to get locked locked in, all that kind of stuff. Okay, uh, if you if you do red teaming, okay, how do you pick your red team? How do you how do you reward people that do a great job of shooting down a pet project from a senior vice president, for example? They should be the ones getting tremendous awards because they just saved your company a huge amount of money. Plus, they saved you from tying up months in a non-competitive uh, non position. Typically, those people, if they're lucky, keep their jobs at all. You know, they wind up in uh, a janitorial uh, uh, systems uh, department or something like that. So, Chet, uh, do you I'm have? I'm on here. That's that, that's about all I can do for you. I'm sorry. Thank you, thank you, Chet. Uh, Chet, do you have time for three more questions? I'll go very, very quickly. Yes. So, three quick questions, uh, folks. So, it's going to be Pegor, Mike, and Aaron. Okay. Pegor, go ahead. What's your question? Yeah. Thank you for speaking with us. My question is: I was watching a video, and the person in the video said that. Another factor of the OODA loop is how fast each side can loop through, can go through the loop, and that the side that goes faster through the loop has an advantage. So I was wondering if you could expand on that idea. I do, yeah. Uh, that's that's something that that that's how it was originally interpreted. That's how Boyd interpreted it right at first. By the way, it turns out it just cannot work that way for a variety of reasons. And I'll refer you to my to my paper, Boyd's OODA loop. Um, um, a Shikant, you can get in the yes. URL. It's at, it's under article. Scroll down to me and you see it was just published recently in, a, in the Norwegian journal. And this is a great problem. Uh, essentially, it's first, it's too slow. Second, what do you mean by going through too fast? Because orientation is what it's all about. Um, so you go through real, real, real fast, but your orientation uh, isn't that good. But you're going fast, you're just going to make a lot of mistakes real quickly. You're going to do a lot of dumb things more quickly than you would have before. In many, many cases, it's better to spend a little extra time keeping your orientation on board. Now, the trick there is to be able to re reorient very quickly, have the best of both worlds. Uh, now, having said all that, where companies are concerned, companies can be considered much more uh, as learning organizations, perhaps, than somebody in actual combat. Uh, you needed to do your learning before you got into the conflict. So think of the OODA loop again. You've got that observe, orient, decide, act down at the bottom. And its function is to basically program orientation. Then you have that implicit guide and controlling. Its function is to control actions. They can be very, very, very quickly. Uh, again, think of you're in a martial arts and things are going very fast. You don't have time to go through any kind of a circular sort of loop. First hiccup you have, you're dead. Everything's got to flow directly from the orientation you have now. So there is something to be said for saying the side that can learn the most the, uh, the most quickly will, will, you know, will have an advantage. That's uh, that's true, but that's a very, very deep, very deep problem because now you've got to say, how do I, how do I reorient, uh, reobserve and reorient now, and come up with new uh, possibilities and test them out, and learn them more quickly than my opponent. And that is true. In that sense, it, it's exactly correct that the uh, the ability to go through that loop more smoothly, more accurately, uh, as uh, again to borrow, to borrow Jim Collins uh, to. Uh, to absorb and use the brutal reality, no matter how bad it hurts the, uh, the senior leadership on the inside, that's very important. So, in that point, in that sense, they're right. I'm sorry we've run out of time, but we can get yep. together another time if you want. Okay. Uh, last, uh, shall we take one last question? One uh, last question. Okay. Last question from Aaron. Aaron, go ahead. Aaron, Aaron you need to unmute yourself. Aaron fell asleep. I knew it was going to happen. It happens every time. <laughs> Aaron, are you there? No. Okay. All right. Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. I, I, I'm okay. here. I, I was just on mute. Sorry. I was. Sure. Um, quick, quick. I, I, I really appreciate your your discussion. Now, the one thing I've always wondered is how much the models that make sense in, um, you know, let's just say life or death situations apply, obviously, in more transient business operating kind of model situations and sort of the emphasis on action or orientation, you know, basically the waiting. Um, and, and the thing I've, I've sort of played with over time is just how to change that waiting. And I don't know if you have any sort of opinion on yeah, that. That's a, that's a great, great question. That's what I tried, tried to kind of head in that direction with, with the OODA loop that you'll see in that paper, where you have the, the red loop on the bottom, observe, orient, decide, and act. Uh, and then you have a, 
a, a blue arrow, the Im implicit guidance and control from orientation straight into action. Uh, if you're in, in the worst possible case, you're in a karate fight, dog fight, something like that. It's almost all, almost all, not 100%, but almost all the blue link. When you get down to something like a like business or a military organization seen as a whole, where it has where it's not in operation all the time, it's also doing training and and refitting, bringing new people in and training them, training in new tactics and new equipment. Now you're you're back down into that into that other thing. They try things occasionally and learn from it, but the big deal there is that is that is that sore OODA loop. Look at what a company does. A lot of what a company is doing is slow motion compared to um, you know, a fight. They're developing products, they're exploring new markets, uh, they're trying to convince regulators, they're, they're, they're working with major customers and depending on what market you're in, uh, um, a sales campaign can run years. In the airplane business I was in two, three years to close a sale was flying right along. Uh, and a lot of that was learning. A lot of that was just making offers to them, trying to learn their organization, uh, trying to learn how they work, trying to learn who's, who's really the decision maker and what really influences them and are they really in Boeing's pocket, you know, kind of as we always assume that, that the decision maker is in the other guy's pocket. Turns out that's very, really very, very rare. Uh, and because um, to get high enough up to make a decision, you've got to prove that you can make good decisions and always, always taking what, one of your suppliers offers you is probably not the best way to have long-term success in that kind of organization. But anyway, a side move. So yeah, so the scale on there says, and even Toyota, Toyota's turning out a car, maybe the fastest to turn out is 18 and a half uh, hours, something like that, 17 hours, 12 hours. Okay, they'd like to, to shorten that by, by continuing to pull waste out of the, uh, out of the system, maybe eventually coming up with a whole new paradigm for uh, for making it, while keeping their 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 quality, of course, going up at the same time. You pull out waste, your quality goes up, your cycle time comes down. Uh, it's a good operational definition of waste. The uh, but even that is 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 glacial compared to a real fight. Then you get into the well, okay, how do you develop a car? Okay, maybe that takes um, eighteen months, two years, if you're really well. They have a system for that too, the Toyota Development System. It moves much more slowly, and its total emphasis is on orientation. They've come up with some really, really clever ways not to iterate. They don't iterate. They kind of condense the final version of the uh, of the car they want out of a cloud of uncertainty, and every step in the process reduces the uncertainty a little bit. Uh, it's fascinating what they. Uh, you know, uh, it's, it's, a, it's like a VUCA yeah. funnel is what they're exactly on. exactly exactly yeah. but there the emphasis is more on that observable end side now, now they still want to go fast because part of that is if they're trying to decide on say an engine um, engine particularly engine design for example they want to explore the entire space of possibilities so they want to explore the biggest space possible but they know they only have so much time to uh, time to do it so in that sense the speed gets down to put up a peg or saying how quickly can you accurately go through that learning loop. The trick there, and, and how do you know? Well, eventually it comes back to finger spits and get through on the part of the people, on the part of, of, of the people running it. Every Toyota program has got a, a, a person who runs it, who's come up through the ranks. They first do engineering, the finger spits and get through on that side, and then through previous development programs. And they've got a good, and they've known each other for years. Uh, so they've got a good feel for what's working, what's not, who can be trusted, who can't, all that kind of good stuff. Uh, so yeah, harmonizing those uh, those two, and not trying to to use the implicit loop when you're really still in the development um, or learning loop. Very very important. Very very good question. And sure. I think it's something that's every company's got to work out for its own. And we're still learning more about how to do it. Chet, thank you so much. This has been a tremendous honor. Well, really, you, really appreciate it. Uh, just, uh, it is very, very special. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for having me on. Y'all enjoy the rest of your Saturdays and everybody stay safe. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Chet. Okay. Uh, you folks, All right. Thank you, uh, folks. So we are now going into breakout rooms to discuss what we heard. And then uh, the breakout rooms will run for 20 minutes, after which we'll come back here to share our takeaways, starting the breakout rooms now. Welcome back, folks. Welcome back. All right, so it's time for takeaways, but I wanna tell you about what's coming up next. Uh, at five o'clock, we have a historian, uh, C. Bradley Thompson, who'll be here. And I'm gonna be interviewing him on his book. It's called The American Revolutionary Mind. 
he talks about how America was formed. He talks about what is the character, you know, Jefferson actually coined this term of American mind, which is unique, which is different from what was there before. John Adams talks, up, talks about the real American revolution by which he means the process through which this American mind developed. And that culminates into Declaration of Independence. So we're gonna be talking about the story of that. You know, uh, Brad Thompson is going to be talking about that. He's written a full book on that. So that's what is coming up at five o'clock. At 2.30, uh, we're gonna be talking about art. We're gonna be, the topic is aesthetic vacuum of our age. So that's what is coming up at 2.30. But now I wanna hear what you guys thought of the presentation interview what did you get? What are you walking away with? In order to share your takeaways, you can go ahead and type exclamation mark in Zoom. I really want to know how how it is, uh, you know, what, what you thought of it, because I'm planning to do a lot more of these author interviews. I also plan to do more stuff on Boyd. So I will start with uh, Jeff and Rob. Jeff. Yeah, for me, I think there are two things that really uh, stood out um, in developing my understanding on Boyd. So the first of which was um, really the emphasis on orientation. Um, and uh, so the quality of that cycle is something that Rob brought up in our uh, breakout section as well. But um, it's not just go as fast as you possibly can, uh, but it's um, make sure you're integrating uh, your new observations well uh, into your understanding. The, the second point, um, was uh, really sort of thinking about the relationship between this and uh, Kahneman's system one and two. Um, and I think before I thought of Boyd as a very system two uh, kind of a guy, um, but I think this uh, re uh, reading Chet's book and then this conversation made me really appreciate the role of um, sort of using system two to program system one such that uh, uh, when, uh, if you're in hand-to-hand -hand combat or whatever, that you're ready to go and sort of cycle through immediately and automatically without having to reflect on it. Excellent. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, next up is Rob, Brian, and Laura. Rob, uh, you're on mute. You did. I know. I classic mistake. Uh, uh, so Jeff stole my thunder a little bit on uh, the thing. The big thing that I, you know, and I, I turned out to be more familiar with the, the, all the UDA stuff than I than I realized. Um, but the thing that was new was this idea. You know, when when the UDA loop was usually originally sort of put forward was an emphasis on the idea that if you can make decisions faster than the other guy, if you can go through your loop faster than he can, you know, you get inside his decision cycle, I think was the one version of I heard, that then you'll win. And the emphasis on, well, it's not necessarily about going faster, it's about having a better orientation and a more, better, more accurate orientation, the ability to take in all the different facts and, and have the finger spits and give fuel and, and to know what's going on. Um, and the other thing I wanted to throw out, because I talked a little bit about this in the breakout room, um, in my field uh, of politics, I think we've just seen the last five years, it's just a massive breakdown of the OTA loop, uh, mm -hmm. where, uh, you know, and one small example of that I want to put forward, something I figured out, it took me a while to figure out about Donald Trump, is this typical politician going by the old rules would decide that um, if I'm in trouble, if I have a controversy, if I have a gaffe, if I say something offensive, that's bad, I should keep that to a minimum because my supporters have a certain amount of regard for me, a certain amount of willingness to go to bat for me, but it's, it's not unlimited. I should call on that as little as often. They should have to defend me and excuse me as little as often, as, 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 as little as possible. Whereas Trump says, I'm gonna say something offensive and then you know the next day I'm gonna say something else offensive and then I'm gonna do something outrageous and I'm gonna do this and just keep you constantly overwhelmed so that first of all, the usual mechanisms for beating a politician down for saying something offensive break down. They don't work because you've gone on to the next thing already. But the big genius of it, I mean, the sort of evil genius of it is he realized the more often my people are called upon to defend me and excuse me, the more they will become committed to doing that as a lifestyle, it will become part of their identity. I am a person who makes excuses for Donald Trump. And so by doing it more often, they'll become more committed to doing it. They'll do it for me more than they would ever do for George W. Bush or for, or for, any, you know, for previous politicians. So it's an amazing that he, he found ways to just like do things in an unconventional way, not through, I don't think the great genius, but just through instinct or somehow, you know, he just hit upon some ways to do things in unconventional ways that totally caused the, 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 uh -huh. the, 
Well, no, it, there wasn't an OODA loop. He just totally caused the old ways of doing things to become inappropriate and people couldn't get the OODA loop going to take that on board and come up with new solutions. So I think it's a fascinating example of all of this that writ large in the last five years. Excellent. Thanks, Rob. Uh, next up is Brian followed by Laura. Brian, uh, anybody else who wants to share their takeaways? Please go ahead and type an exclamation mark. Uh, Brian followed by Laura. Brian. Okay, um, this was one of the uh, most interesting presentations I've seen for a long time. Um, also one of the most difficult to follow. Um, it's not an area that I'm very well um, versed in. Um, yeah, always... who's there? <laughs> yeah, oh, go ahead, Brian. I know a little bit about the, uh, the, the Toyota model and one or two of the smaller ones, but not much else. But this guy, it took a, it took a lot of effort to keep up with him, quite honestly. Um, very, very impressive. Enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, thanks, Brian. I'm planning to do more presentations on that. Uh, so stay tuned. Um, Laura, you had, you had a Laura followed by Maritza. Laura, you had a takeaway. Okay. Uh, next up is Maritza followed by Great Heart. Um, I have to admit that while, well, you know, when I, I worked in the military, well, I didn't work in the military. I was a contractor for DOD for about 15, 20 years. And, you know, so you hear of the OODA loop and you're, you have a vague idea or concept of what it is. And it's always, um, you know, what you think of it as a decision-making process. Um, until you mentioned it uh, a week or so ago, I never took a, like a deeper dive into the, the concept, the thoughts behind the man who actually created it. And so I find this all to be fascinating and, and helpful. And I, you know, what it brings to mind for me is that um, the idea of, you know, we're trying to solve for the for Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, it's kind of what comes to mind to me is that, that what we're trying to do here is give, up, give ourselves a grasp on what, you know, how to deal with uncertainty, how do we deal with the massive amounts of information. And then it's interesting that it's almost more relevant now than it may have been when it was first created because the, the amount of information that we have to filter out is so far vast. And um, I agree with Rob and a little bit with what, you know, and Jeff also touched on it, you know, in our, in our discussion group, the concept of this slowing down becomes so much more vital. And, but it's, it's like, how do you do that? Because if you're slowing down, do you miss things or do you avoid missing things? So it's, it's interesting. And I, I'd be looking forward to hearing more on it and learning more. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks, uh, Marisa. Next up is Great Heart followed by Martin. So this was, uh, <clears throat> this was all very new to me, but reminiscent of many things I've run across in business and uh, models I've seen in business. I taught in business school. The, uh, so I think a lot of this might've been, a lot of the models I've seen in business school might've been informed by John Boyd. It's really very impressive. The, um, the one thing I, you're just asking for takeaways. I don't, don't you know, claim any, importance or validity for this but the thing that strikes me in this is the um that there is and this came out a bit in the end there is a kind of a, a two loop he, he called it the blue and the red and i haven't seen his article or anything but as i understand it there's the kind of the preparation loop and the training loop and then there's the action loop when you really go into battle and the um The thing that I feel that I was asking, how do you integrate, I asked, this was in our group, I asked somebody, how do we integrate the learning and the training, or excuse me, the doing and the learning? And the one answer was it's reiterative, which is true. Uh, in other words, let's say after you've, after you've been in battle, you prep for the battle, you've been in battle, and after you've been in battle, you take what you learn back into the loop as a learning. The, uh, but the other thing that strikes me, and this was brought out uh, in the, the steps of the, that where I use the German, uh, and I call it a, the autonomy. The fourth step is to just let me do it. So somebody has been trained up, but at the end of the day, they're going into battle. You just have to let them do it. So that would be called Auftakt or Auftakt. And the, um, but that's the, I would call that autonomy. 
the person needs to be given autonomy to just do his thing because whatever the training is, it's probably not gonna be 100% sufficient for the concrete situation he's or she is confronting. So I, I was just trying to integrate preparation and action or learning and action. And those were the two ways I came away with that. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I just wanted to remind everybody that we have another great meetup, military-based meetup tomorrow at 12. General Dan Bolger is going to be here and he's going to be talking about his book, Battle for Hunger Hill. And the theme of that book is very similar to the problem that John Boyd is solving. What happened was that many, many, many people in the military saw that American troops did not perform well in Vietnam against the insurgents. And they were trying to, just like John Boyd, they were trying to figure out what, how do you fight insurgents? And this is a story of how him as a battalion commander learned to do that. And he actually tells the story and it is profound. Actually, the rules I have for this meetup come from that book, uh, are inspired by that book. The four rules that I have uh, comes from that. So that's a teaser for tomorrow. And I did not know that he was, a, when I invited him, I did not know that he was a three-star general commanding 70,000 troops. So he's an amazing person. So don't miss it tomorrow at 12 p.m. Eastern time. Next up is going to be Martin followed by Aaron. Martin. Hi. Um, well, one, one thing it's, I, I, uh, that surprised me is how much we are involved in the war language. I mean, in general, I mean, how, the logic of war, we are in, 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 in this in, in everywhere. And I think we need to, to go forward th that type of system. Uh, and otherwise, it's concerned me that it's very important, or I think it's very important in the next future, how we manage information and, and what happened with that information that we administrate. Other thing that I was thinking is, what if, if the UDA loop is about only speed, or that is the most important thing, or respect the processes between the, the steps that you need to follow, or it's a mix in between. And also, for me, it's very interesting, uh, Shrikant, this type of uh, meetings like we, like this person that we had today, because it's something you put uh, scenarios that we normally people don't put, and, and it's very interesting what happened and when you mix that. Um, and, and I think it's very interesting when, when you put different subjects, uh, mix it in, in, in a conversation very different be, between each other and, and, and what happened with, with that mix or that chemistry. I mean, that is very interesting, I think, and, and we need more of that. Oh, well, thank, <laughs> thank you. you. Oh, thank you, oh, Martin, appreciate that. I mean, this is again, uh, also very similar to Boyd's point. What he's saying is that you take concepts from every field, you separate them out so that they are not in the silo, in the concept, in the, in the field itself, separated from all other concepts. So that's what he calls uh, destruction, you know, or you know, destructive deduction of kind of separating out uh, elements or unstructuring of the current ones. And then what you're doing is that you're doing creative or constructive induction, but you're mm -hmm. taking elements. So you're taking this con these concepts from military and you're saying, you know, yes, they are very useful in military, but what, where, what is the, what is a more general way of looking at it? To what extent can I use it everywhere? And that's what you're trying to do. So it is very much, and this is what we do in our kind of comprehensivist. Wednesdays are all about this. Um, this is polymath. This is kind of being transdisciplinary. It holds that the world is one. And what you're trying to do is that you're trying to understand what is going on. And by taking different fields and taking concepts from it, understanding it at a deep level, generalizing them so that they become universal, mm -hmm. you're able to leverage what has been learned in a one particular context by human beings and apply it across the board. 
So that's what that's what we are doing. So thank you, thank you for that observation. Yes, the, the, is... sorry, I want to add some short thing. It's what I what you're talking about is about the the fundamental principles of things. I like it's like the backbone of the things, and that is for me it's the most important thing to understand. And otherwise, you you know that you we have a book that the name is a very famous one, the the art of war, the Sun Tzu. But otherwise, the, the marketing people use another one that is very good too, that is like the book of the five rings, that is from Musashi, that is another samurai. Yes, I've heard, heard of that. Yeah, thank you, thank you, uh, appreciate that. It's a very good um, one. Thank you, Martin. Um, next up is going to be Aaron, and then we will be wrapping up so we can uh, have a short break before our next meetup that starts at 2.30. Aaron, what did you think? Oh, no, thanks. Uh, this was a fantastic um, opportunity for everyone. And I really appreciate Srikant. And then, uh, and Maritza and, and, uh, and Jeff, um, uh, and uh, I think it was Rob also that was in the group. Uh, you know, they had fantastic points. I, I think one thing that becomes important is that, and, and, and I don't know your name, actually, Great Heart, but uh, uh, the points he was making about autonomy, I think, are really critical. Um, especially when you are, when you need to be in a position for the, for the observe cycle, because if you don't have autonomy, then that, that implicit guidance and control, then you're not able to really, you know, then all you're doing is taking orders off of somebody else's orientation. And, uh, and then, and then that starts to become its own feedback loop. So I think, you know, just as a lesson that I've learned over the years, both in business and then prior to that in the military, and then just also in regular life, you know, coaching kids in sports or whatever is uh, volunteering, is that you really want to distribute autonomy for the exercise of that observation and, and guidance and control itself for that journey, independent of the right decision being made. Right. And then, you know, so it's, I've always called it like, you, you don't want to be a strategic helicopter parent, right? Because then you're just, you're basically the same way helicopter parents demolish their kids by the time they're 25 and their kids can't fill out a mortgage application without a, you know, parent looking at it uh, or anything. Um, you, you sort of demolish those people's ability over time to sort of have the agency to go through that observation process. And so I think that's an important, that's a, to me, I've always found that's a really ascent, that's almost like an essentialism is that, is, is to get that observation and guidance and control piece and the autonomy around that. And, and I found the more you can invest in that in people and just sort of give them, you know, let's just say reference points for or, or simulations for orientation and decisions people will figure it out. People aren't stupid. People are brilliant. We have collective intelligence that's just insane. I mean, so it's just, but it's about, it's critical to me to have that. And, and the, one of the best examples of this I've ever seen, uh, and I never realized this till recently, so my mom was a chef growing up and it's the way a great restaurant runs in the back of the house. If you can think about that, if any of you had an experience when you you know started working or whatever, and you worked in a restaurant or whatever, it's the concept of you know the executive chef, the main chef, the sous chefs, the line the line cooks, all the way down to the preppers, and if you get that kind of autonomy and uh, you know kind of the the leadership right around that, you'll have a fantastic back of the house. If you don't, it's like a train wreck, you know. And it'll be, you know, it's like Stalin at that point. It'll just be a, you know, an authoritarian enterprise. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Appreciate that. Um, I just want to let you know that I'm going to do a presentation on John Boyd's paper uh, called Destruction and Creation, which is very short, about seven page paper. Um, I will be probably doing it in about, uh, I think on 27th. Uh, I'm going to change that uh, 27th. That's a Wednesday at 9 p.m. I'm going to change that meetup to do a presentation on this. It's a short enough paper that gives the core epistemology that or core method of thinking 
that Boyd is using uh, and look forward to seeing you there. Uh, I've just put a link to uh, Chet's websites. This is the article section. It has all of John Boyd's presentations there, as well as a lot of commentary by Chet and other people on Boyd. So uh, do explore it further. And if you have any comments, um, you can write to me at 52livingideas at gmail.com. All right, folks, so thank you so much for this. Uh, and we are going to start 